But I think we're past that startup race. I think podcasting is a medium and it's where we are. And we're going to see double digit growth year over year. We're not going to see four, five, six X or whatever we saw. We're not going to see the COVID boom again. Um, and now that it's long term, it's about education and preventing those mistakes because every one of those mistakes could be margin that makes you profitable, could be jobs you save. This is Podcast Perspectives, a show about the latest news in the podcast industry and the people behind it. I'm your host, Jeff Umbro, founder and CEO of The Podglomerate. Today on the show, I'm speaking with Brian Barletta, founder and partner at Sounds Profitable, a company which covers the audio world and partners with over 140 players in the industry to set the course of the business side of podcasting. Today, we will chat with Brian about Sounds Profitable, its mission, business model, strategy, in this moment in the industry and what happens when Sounds Profitable's mission conflicts with the business model of the rest of the industry. Let's get right to it. Hey, Brad, thank you for joining us. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I guess to start, what is Sounds Profitable in your your words? I guess we're a research and advocacy firm focused on growing podcasting through listenership and monetization. That's the, the tagline that we go with. And it's a mouthful, right? It's uh, it, it doesn't get easier to understand until I break it down into a few more things. I mean, we saw, you know, uh, what trade associations can do for other uh, industries, and we have one. We have the IAB. ANA is a little bit active in audio. There's opportunities there, but there was nothing podcast specific. So I think we emulate a lot of the ideals that we want to see out of a trade association in podcasting. That's the first one. We also have uh, newsletters, a lot of them that go out to basically everybody in the business of podcasting, trying to educate them on what's going on in the industry, how they can apply it, how they can compare and understand uh, advertising, marketing, and content in other channels as well. And then live events and support there. I mean, we really want our partners to benefit and the whole industry to benefit from everywhere that they spend money or they're asked to spend money. So we have lounges at uh, you know major events like Podcast Movement, Pod Show London, it sounds like you're busy. Um, <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> well, so if you're talking to somebody who's not in the space or somebody just entering the space, because that's hopefully the audience of this show, I would go to Sounds Profitable for A, research and content about the industry, and B, uh, if I'm going to become a sponsor or something, like uh, connections and, and know-how, um, kind of going a little bit below the hood when it comes to like how to optimize X, Y, and Z. Would, would you say that that's accurate? Yeah. Yeah. And I I think if you're taking podcasting as a business seriously, and that could be anything, right? That could be, you're not investing money, but you're investing time. That's absolutely valid, right? Like you, you have a business plan, you have a mindset on it. This isn't just like you're putting up 10 episodes and you're hoping that someone's going to discover you. You really want to put effort into it. We have something for you uh, at every part of it. I do want to emphasize it's not sponsorship. We call it partnership because the the real mindset is that all the content's actually free. Everything that we put out there, when people ask us questions, I can point to an article, I can point to something that we've recorded at one point or another to share to them so that they can get it. The, what partners get on top of helping us accomplish all of this really is the, well, let's break that down. Let's take that article and topic. Let's understand your specific issue and work on it hands in hand. It's not a requirement. If anybody, anybody listening to this reads Sounds Profitable or listens to Sounds Profitable and has a question, if they hit reply, it goes right to me and I absolutely put in time to make sure that we answer people's questions because sometimes we went too far over the head. Sometimes we didn't link back to an older article. We made assumptions. So we want to help everybody get up to speed. I I don't usually talk about Puglomerate in the context of the people that we're speaking with, but I do want to talk about it here because I think it can provide some examples um, and like anecdotes of like how this did effectively work for us. Years ago, I was speaking with Brian about how we can optimize like our programmatic marketplace on our podcasts. Uh, Brian gave me a lot of really valuable tips on like how we can set up our tech stack in such a way that it would optimize what we're doing most efficiently. Um, and, and Brian, I don't know if I've told you this recently, but like I can directly point to something around the line, along the lines of like five figures in revenue that came in that was not annually, that was not coming in before. So the way I like to think about Sounds Profitable is if you use it properly, if you use your services and community properly, then you can directly influence the success of the different initiatives that you are trying to take. 
usually in the ads, the ad tech space, but like, you know, and I know in the last couple of years, you've been expanding beyond that. Yeah. I, my, my background is ad tech. And honestly, that's really cool to hear. I wish we could get more people to tell me stuff like that, because I, I do want to emphasize to the people listening, we don't do commission kickback, anything like that. We don't hold equity advisory board seats in any company. Um, it's really, really important. And we also own the company outright. It's really important for us to be as neutral as possible as a for-profit company. So everything is flat rate based, but like that's, that's the, my background, like the ad tech, the BD and the connections there, Tom is killer on the branding and research. I mean, the amount of companies we get the opportunity to dig into lately where they have the potential to tap into a 55 plus audience or a Gen Z audience, right? Or their podcast was killer, but it was too wide. So what direction can we give them from research and study? And then honestly, we end up introducing them to people like you, to bumper, to other great people because our goal as consultants is the conversation and sharing and connection. We're not contractors. We're not going to execute. We're not going to run media plans. But the ad tech stuff is just fun for me because that was my background. I helped build a lot of it in this space and in other spaces. And being able to say, oh, awesome. You ha I heard you have some new inventory in you know, the Middle East. Well, I actually just met a partner over there who's doing great at it and is looking for more inventory because they have plenty of demand for, you know, really popular English language podcasts. And being able to make those connections is really fun, helping people set up their unique stack. Because again, all the information is there, but the nuance of, well, it's not one size fits all. That's where we really get to, to work with people. And I really enjoy it. So you uh, have on your website that sounds profitable, has education, resources, and insights into the podcasting industry. Why? big picture to does the industry need that you know there's so many waves of it we're like 20 years deep into this medium everybody can point back to they're like oh that was a podcast that i downloaded and listened to as an mp3 on my computer um things have changed a lot but they also haven't uh, we are hiring and we're growing and we're um we're trying to build this into a bigger space we're chasing an advertising number more than anything else we're not talking about the total number of people employed by the industry. We're not talking about the major IPs in it. The, the numbers we tend to chase are just advertising based. So things get lost. And it's very, very easy for people to just buy into the company culture. You ask a question and you get that company specific answer, not the podcast industry's answer. You don't have a place that you can reference it. You have an email, you have a Slack chat where someone said something when you asked a question. We're just trying to, to centralize it. And it's funny, there's so many different things. Like, you, you know, you're saying baked in, I'm saying integrated. In 2018, the IAB in the guide wrote that what we call baked in is integrated ads. And all of the publishers, all of the hosting platforms, everybody who signed off on it agreed to that. Nobody uses that. So, you know, we put out a glossary. And, you know, that was a great starting point there. The IAB just put out a buyer's guide, which is an interesting starting point for them on that side there. And we're building out educational content for people to hire and bring in people who know nothing about podcasting to grow our space with intelligent people um, and, you know, really catch them up on the stuff that I think is easier, right? If we put that effort in there and educate them, a lot less headache and heartache, you know? Uh, I think too many people in the space, unfortunately, have gained their knowledge through mistakes more than they have <laughs> from reading about it or being sat down and taught anything. Yeah, it's the best way to learn, to be honest. I've caused millions of dollars in damages. All right, so we're going to have our, our lawyer like review this, but... <laughs> <laughs> but it's... No, but it's uh, like I've, I've definitely caused ad ops mistakes, massive mistakes. I, I served a full screen ad in an iPad, the launch of the iPad for the New York Times with no close button, right? The, we had to update the entire spec of how mobile ads work so that the close button wasn't part of the creative file, but was rather part of the SDK in the app because of those mistakes. And I think in a startup race, those mistakes can happen. But I think we're past that startup race. I think podcasting is a medium and it's where we are. And we're going to see double digit growth year over year. We're not going to see four, five, six X or whatever we saw. We're not going to see the COVID boom again. Um, and now that it's long term, it's about education and preventing those mistakes because every one of those mistakes could be margin that makes you profitable, could be jobs you save. Yeah, I, I think generally, like, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I read on the website that Sounds Profitable's mission, in your own words, is to set the course of the future of the audio business. And we've talked a lot about what that might be on this call, but like, 
here's here's a platform for you to say like what do you think or what do you want to see as the future of the audio industry i've spent a lot of time in a lot of organizations that have audio uh groups iab ana um you know i've, I've dug into other places podcast is the only thing talked about there streaming's figured out there's not tech lab about uh, streaming really there's not any of that stuff uh dug into that music and streaming radio and and all that seem to be settled so podcasting is that outlier um i think we get to decide what we want to be and i think that if we want to be our own channel we have to accept that that growth might be slow and it might be long and it might be hard work it might be accepting those unfavorable deal terms because if that buyer leaves the space because too many people said no then that number drops and if that number drops no brand advertisers aren't going to come in there it needs to be we have to ride the wave and then convert the wave right um but alternatively we could just you know the driving the course of the future audio we could simply become influencer marketing we could simply become uh like it be in the same category as Instagram and YouTube and all of these other places and be the most performant part of that. There's a lot of ego tied up in that, but sometimes I think that that could be the best thing for audio, right? Is audio supposed to be a destination for everything or is it the glue that holds everything together? And those are the things that we need to think about as an industry. And I think each company really has the opportunity there. And we see that from a handful of companies saying, we don't just sell podcast ads. We sell sponsorship across social newsletter, live events, podcast, video, all like phone call endorsement. Like you name it, they can plug it into that model. And that's really powerful for some. And then others say we're a podcast business. What we do is we put out podcasts, you get us on Apple, end of the story. I think a lot of the people who are running the integrated campaigns across different platforms and also including audio kind of got there by mistake. Uh, and I'm very jealous because that's, in my opinion, the right answer. But like, also, it's funny, like how people got from point A to point B. Yeah, I, I do envy those people constantly, the ones who fall into that sponsorship package, because advertising is a CPM game and is buyer side. Sponsorship is a publisher game. You get to define what it is, that entity. You can't pick it apart. It's buying a value meal. More expensive if you want all the pieces separately. I think that the work that you do in a lot of ways is essential to like, the growth of the industry. Uh, one example of this is um, a conversation that I know you've been having actively throughout the industry for the last several months, which was essentially uh, flagging that there was auto downloads happening um, on Apple Podcasts based on people adopting like new devices and operating systems. Um, I'm probably oversimplifying that, but the result of that is that Apple has actually changed the way in which they are going to have the functionality of the app. Um, Apple considers that a feature. You consider that a bug uh, with the auto downloads. Yeah, so I, I think truly Apple has been aware of the auto, like auto download is a very listener centric feature and Apple is very smart with their listen data and how they are protective of users. I, I own so many Apple products. Like I'm not here in any way to uh, to disparage them. I, I really do think they do killer work. It was just, a lot of separate conversations from separate hosting platforms and separate publishers saying, hey, we're seeing this and we don't think that these downloads are actually being listened to. And it's tough because Apple is a big company. Podcasting is a very small part of it for them. And, you know, there wasn't a, uh, the ability to have unification around that. It had been identified in some ways, but uh, the team at Podscribe actually identified it from a very, very specific angle that was a, uh, that allowed us to kind of really pinpoint it. We provided all that data. I grabbed all my partners together. Everybody who could share that data, we provided it. And what was really neat is we've been digging into this for a while. And, and there was a lot of concern about it becoming public and becoming a big deal and drama and gossip. And we brought 150 companies together, shared it with them and said, please keep this private as we work on it. Right. We elevated it to Apple. They they said, you know, we still believe listen is the primary metric. We'll look into it. And then it just kind of sat. We brought it to the IAB didn't move fast enough, right? And as it was starting to move and people were starting to share in the IAB, uh, we kind of got wind that Apple might be making changes. Come iOS 17 release with the, uh, you know, the, the latest iPhone, what, what they did was a change related to, let's say auto downloading stopped at episode 100 and you came back at episode 200 and hit auto download again. Previously, it would say immediately download episode 101 through 200 right now. They've since changed that to when you hit auto download, it'll only download what's coming next, not anything that you've missed. Um, 
But what one of the cool things that they added is if you press play on something that you previously auto downloaded, it will and it had turned off, it will start that back up, which is, I think, a really helpful feature and very likely that if you're going to listen to the new episode, you'd like to continue listening to them. Um, they made a few other changes related to like backdated episodes and um, we're seeing some other changes there, but you know, they're in a tough spot. It's built into the operating system. So that means that like we're seeing 10, 15% adoption today. Yeah, uh, it could be, it was 10 months, I think for iOS 16 to hit about 80%. So this is going to be something that changes over time and, and we're going to see downloads decline a little bit. Just to be clear, by the way, I also think that your job in this instance is simply, and you just kind of hit this, but it's simply to point out the fact that this is a thing and then other people decide how they want to actually, you know, integrate that yeah. or not. I'm I'm so torn on this entire conversation uh, about that particular, you know, situation, because on the one hand, you're not actually impacting the number of real true listeners to a show. Uh, there is no change there. Correct. What will change is the results that you see. And for a lot of shows, especially legacy ones, that number is going to go down and potentially significantly down. Uh, which does mean in many cases, uh, like you follow the thread there, it means that you have a smaller b business, you have less revenue, you might have to lay people off, that kind of thing. On the one hand, you're uh, making the integrity of the industry better because people can trust it more and it will lead to future growth. But short term, this market correction is going to have impact and uh, yeah, and I, I don't mean to, I'm, I promise I'm not pointing fingers or anything like that. I'm just like, I've kind of just been like noodling with that thought the last couple of weeks. It's not easy, right? Uh, but I think that the, the hard part is, is in podcasting, we don't control the apps. A lot of most hosting platforms are IAB certified at this point. Can IAB be better? Yeah. And, it, and I'm working hard to continue to push that on behalf of all my partners and behalf of all the space. But at the end of the day, Apple made this change. We didn't know it was coming. We'd escalated it to them. We would have loved to be more involved with them, but that's not how they operate. I don't think that auto download, like we're seeing how Spotify chooses not to really implement it, or you have to, you have to go so many steps deep to actually download in Spotify. Yeah. You have to turn it on. And we don't have the same problems over there, right? It's a little bit closer in the numbers there. But yeah, I mean, the slowness of this upgrade, right? The adoption, it will reduce total downloads, which will reduce total impressions. And I encourage people to not have the knee-jerk reaction to immediately add more ad inventory, right? Just don't just add more ad slots or placements. Um, look at how much available inventory you had, but realize that it'll help with performance because those downloads, when you came back at episode 200, maybe you re-listened to episode 101 through 200, but it's very unlikely. That's concerning on that end because the end result there is less performance. While we're on the topic, um, I would love to know like what your opinion of the ad marketplace is today, um, just given kind of the, the ebbs and flows that we've seen in the last year. I wrote um, our three-year anniversary article I wrote called Ad Technical Difficulties. And um, what I will say is I think there are still hungry buyers, but I think that the reason we didn't hit the two billion number, uh, one, I think that you know the IEB's projections were too aggressive. I don't think they had enough data to to do that. I think they ran into the hype and overhit it a little bit too. But two, I think we alienated a lot of those buyers that helped us get to this place that really have perfected how they buy ads, which for a lot of them is integrated or baked in ads. And they have a very specific model and they're willing to pay top dollar for it because they know how to get performance out of it. And I think that the technology became a forefront for us because we wanted to push into brand advertising, which meant programmatic, which meant run of show and run of network. And we pushed that tech to emulate these other solutions and and not all of it works. So what I will say is that I think the buyers that are here are here. They're like two feet in, they're committed. We've lost some buyers and some of those people will never get back because they're Boston and ask them to buy podcasts and ask them to buy audio or they ask them to buy things that perform and they're over somewhere else while they're watching CTV numbers go down while they're you know, uh, learning things about uh, influencers and, and other areas that take as much hands-on time, but maybe, maybe hit a little bit harder for them. Um, so I think that we have good buyers there, but we, we need to be responsive to them. We need to be respectful to them. We need to understand where they are uh, and what they want to buy. And remember that if you ordered a steak and somebody brought you a chicken, you wouldn't pay for it either. Um, I think the, I think people are spending well. I think podcasting is doing 
particularly well against a lot of other ad channels. But I think that podcasting is big. And I think there are a lot of people here. And I think there are a lot of moving parts. I think there's shifts in agencies. I think there's shifts in brands coming in direct. And I think that there's uh, consolidation in publishers. There's less new shows coming out. Um, I think I think the ad market is strong at a time where an ad market, or the whole ad market, not just podcasting, is coming back around out of a will they, won't they recession. That's the good appetizer to get to kind of the thing that I'm seeing as a publisher in the industry. It's a, it's a buyer's market, not a seller's market. And the buyers yeah. all want different things. And it's causing us all kinds of issues when it comes to like how we provide these services to these partners of ours. A lot of the um, agencies seem to be asking for a lot of things that they didn't use to, uh, such as, you know, frequency capping, actualization. Um, they want like refreshed ad rates more often than they used to ask for them. Uh, none of those on their own are bad. It's just all of them together do cause a lot of yeah. burden for the publishers. And, you know, it's doable. I guess my my broader point is like, it's almost not worth doing based on the amount of administrative burden that comes from doing it different ways from every one of these buyers. Uh, and I'm wondering if because we are at this point in the industry where like publishers are hungry for new ad like units because of the last year where we've kind of had like a little bit of a drought. Uh, I don't know. Do you see that normalizing at all in the future? What I will say is that I've been asking a lot of the buyers that we work with, we work with about eight agencies and three brands directly, but asking them to see their IOs because I want to read through them. And some things like we need to improve on. One of the things that I see on there is like offensive content, right? Like, hey, Jeff, it's Tuesday. I'm offended. You have no recourse, right? That's not great for you as a publisher. But if I say I use Barometer, I use Podscribe, I use uh, Sonnet, I use any of these uh, brand safety solutions out there, and I say, if you utilize any of these and you pass the threshold, there's like there's no discussion, right? I, I can't be offended. And heck, the competitive separation area, like I've had to pull a few partners aside and be like, hey, this isn't technically possible in any way. Like, like even with a team of 10 people, I could not guarantee the separation that you're asking for here. If you're looking for like a whole exit clause, like you got it. But like, this is probably never been securely set up on any of your campaigns. So let's make it more logical. But that's that's a, a big initiative we have for the re end of the year is to get all of our buyers together and maybe work on a unified I.O. that basically says, if I do want this thing that's very custom and very specific, I am prepared to pay for it. But if you want me to buy into your things, there has to be price accommodations and and other accommodations for it if it doesn't work out as set. In a full circle moment, I feel like uh, a lot of the things that you provide, it sounds profitable. Um are really essential here because I think a lot of the buyers and frankly, a lot of the sellers need to be educated with what they're actually buying and selling. But uh, what can we learn from other industries, like good and bad? What should we adopt slash avoid? From, you mentioned that like IAB has already solved other industries. Like what did they do right? And what should we pay attention to and like avoid? So the, the reason uh, we started the download was because uh, it's not just the business of podcasting, but it's the, the pressures that uh, lean on the business of podcasting and advertising, content, and marketing. A lot of what we focus on there is trying to educate people about these other spaces. Like uh, uh, there was one that was like 60 or 70% of marketers are confused about media mix modeling, which is we get pushback on that all the time. How am I supposed to fit podcasting in there? It's like, well, nobody seems to know how to use it, period, the end. So why are we getting beat up for that? We get the privacy conversations about IP address when the real conversation is about device ID and cookie and and more things there. IP is the bottom of the barrel. Let other people fight this. And let me show you the other people that are getting beat up and are defending it on levels higher than IP. So I think what we can learn from other spaces is the grass is always greener. There's more competition in those spaces. There are more tech vendors. There are more layers. There's more, uh, they're not friendly like podcasting. Like we are several years, if not more, away from really having to be at each other's throats because the truth is is we're all not we're not competing with each other yet we're competing with not podcasting <laughs> so being able to highlight those other spaces where like god nielsen lost their mrc accreditation right they're, they're the the validity of their model for being measurement for tv and everybody pounced everybody pounced right pod sites got acquired by spotify and everybody started picking up
getting into attribution, but like it yeah. wasn't negative and competitive. It wasn't people paying no. to be on the front of that age to be be the first person to smear them for yeah. that, right? It was, here's an alternative. Here's something else we can do. Here's these other ideas. So I want to end this with um, kind of a fun, like uh, lightning round. Um, you've mentioned several times on this call that like one of your focuses are education, making sure that everybody is kind of thinking about things in the same way. So I'm going to ask you a bunch of stuff and, and ask you to explain the difference. Uh, Download versus listen versus stream. All right. Uh, download is from your hosting platform. It's when 60 seconds of the audio file has been sent to the listener's device. So sending from that hosting platform. We don't, not, not necessarily receiving or anything like that, but it's been transmitted down there. A listen is an in-app metric. So that's, and it's unique between Apple and Spotify. They count them different. The app is saying an action has cur occurred that we call a listen. Sometimes it's greater than zero seconds. Sometimes it's 10, 30 seconds. Uh, things like that. And streaming is not something that exists in podcasting. I mean, streaming is the continue, uh, the continual uh, uh, communication between the, the platform and the player so that in real time, it is being sent a little bit at a time. Download is getting the whole file. Listen is an app metric and streaming is a direct connection. Think like radio, but digitally. What is an impression? By IAB standards, an impression is or would be called ad delivered, and it is when the portion of the episode that contains the ad has been sent to the listener's device. And just one clarification for you, because uh, I get this question a lot. If you have eight ad markers in an episode and somebody mm -hmm. on like, we'll say Apple for this conversation hits play, how many impressions are they delivering? If you have ad markers and it's dynamic ad insertion, what uh, and, and Apple, the way the Apple app seems to download is it asks for the episode in chunks, right? Percentage of the ad episode at a time. So it really depends on how much of the episode they're able to progressively download when they press play. The app is trying to say, give me it as like, I want to download the whole thing, but it's saying, give me 10%. Okay, now give me another 10% and another. You could lose signal. You could stop listening. It happens really fast. So it's we're talking in a minute, maybe two minutes, you could download a several hour podcast immediately. But in Spotify, I believe it says, give me the whole episode in one go, right? Like send the whole file now. So in Spotify, I'd likely be closer to all of them are immediately sent when the person presses play and starts listening to it. In Apple, there's a little bit more discrepancy on it. And again, there's no there's no obligation for any of those players to be certified and adhere to same standards. So I, I wanted to highlight that because of the idea that just because somebody hits play or has downloaded an episode, uh, you may be like tracking like all eight of those ad impressions, but it doesn't necessarily mean that somebody has listened. But so, but at the same time, like no one is actually breaking any rules there. So like there's just I, I want to mention this just to say that like, yeah, there is no perfect solution here. We covered this a little bit, but can you explain um, baked in or integrated ads versus dynamically inserted ads? So integrated would be in the file before it's uploaded to the hosting platform. And uh, and then dynamically inserted is when a marker is placed where you'd like an ad. And when the person presses play and it calls the hosting platform, it says, I have this marker. What campaigns are eligible? And it builds a unique file for them in that moment. Would you prefer a host read or a producer read? Oh, God. I think I'm time sensitive. So I think the shorter, the better. So I, I don't think I'm real picky on that. I've been listening to a lot of Max Fun podcasts lately, and I feel like they get real, real, real long with the host reads, even if they're unique each time. And I find myself skipping and I feel bad about that. So think about it. If I'm doing the dishes and yeah. I have to get my soapy hands into my pocket, you failed. So the faster we get through those ad breaks, the more it sticks with me and the more I don't skip. I love that. Okay. So if you are a new podcaster... Uh, you have like, you're, you're a hobbyist. You have three hours a week to dedicate to this. What are the three metrics that you are paying attention to, to gauge your success? You're having fun. Like I like, no mono sent me one of their mics and me and my, my son, Theo, my oldest, we just record stuff. It's like, it's fun. It's just for us. It'll never get published, but like you get that moment, right? You get to have fun. Whether it's, you know, we make fun of two dudes having a beer and catching up, but like, we're not doing that much further than this. Me and you, like, in our downtime, like this stuff and probably, <laughs> probably annoy our other friends talking about it. So I think having fun is a, is a key one. I think you need to remember how many people 30 people is. Like, look at the room you're sitting in or your house and, and, and think about what 30 people in that room looks like. Um, even 500 people. I spoke in front of 500 people once and I almost vomited. So I think, you know, uh, uh, like understanding the size there. Um, and then 
I would say not wasting time with whatever the next new hype thing is. You don't want to be on YouTube, don't put it on YouTube, right? You don't want to do social clips or anything like that and build a social media following, don't. Like, do what works for you, figure out if it's a business, and then if it is a business, hire people to help you identify the avenues that you will and won't succeed. You may be too broad for some of them. That last like five minutes of this episode is what you all will see every day if you subscribe to Sounds Profitable's newsletter. Uh, so thank you all. Uh, and thank you, Brian, for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you again to Brian Barletta for joining us on this episode of Podcast Perspectives. You can find more from Sounds Profitable at soundsprofitable.com, where you can also sign up for their daily email newsletter. For more podcast-related news, info, and takes, you can follow me on Twitter at Jeff Umbro. Podcast Perspectives is a production of The Podglomerate. If you are looking for help producing, distributing, or monetizing your podcast, you can find us at thepodglomerate.com. Shoot us an email at listen at thepodglomerate.com or follow us on all social platforms at Podglomerate. This episode was produced by Chris Boniello and Henry Lavoie. And thank you to our marketing team, Joni Deutsch, Madison Richards, Morgan Swift, Annabella Penna, and Vanessa Ullman. And a special thank you to Dan Christo. Thanks for listening, and I will catch you next week.